a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I just wanted, before Brother Wade comes back up, uh, I'll have the ushers in the back help us out. We're going to take a love offering, and before we do, uh, we, you've already paid your five dollars. That covered the breakfast, lunch, and the notes, and uh, that's all settled. But uh, Dr. Wade uh, came here and drove here yesterday. We're keeping him over at the Days Inn here for three nights, and uh, we're going to give him hopefully a good love offering for, for coming here and bringing all this. To go to a seminar like this, I go to seminars for my license renewal, you know, as a chiropractor. I spend between $500 and $1,000. Now, if I have to travel, I probably spend around $2,000. If I have to go to Florida, I've got to get a plane, get the hotels, food. Uh, but something like this, Dr. Waite, is, this is, he's in the ministry. And we give a love offering. And what we'd like to do, some people can give more than others. We know that. So we're not, and some people, some of you may not be able to give anything. And that's fine as well. We don't want you to feel that, you know, we're trying to pull anything out of you. But we just want to give him something when he leaves here tomorrow uh, that will make him feel appreciated for what he does. And so if you, does anyone, first of all, need an envelope? Because if you want an offering envelope to put down, uh, we could designate something or go towards your, your taxes. Would anybody like that before we even take an offering? Anyone need an offering envelope? Oh, all right. All right, but these uh, young men, come on up, fellas. We'll just take this offering, and then Dr. Ward will come up, and we'll get into session three. But we appreciate it. We're going to take an offering up tomorrow as well, a regular offering, plus if anyone would like to give to, to defray the cost, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow as well. I'm going to ask if uh, a brother here would take an off, uh, would say the prayer, Brother Yank County here, Alvin. Lacho was going to be here today, you know, our missionary to Guyana, Alvin's dad, but he had to work, right? He got called in. Last minute. Pray for that show and his family, Alvin and Alcina and the girls. They'll be heading back October 24th to Guyana, South America, back to the two churches that he's pastoring down there. We had a great time with them being here back home, but we know that God's called them down there and they'll be leaving. So Alvin's going to pray, and uh, when he says amen, they'll come around with the plates. Alvin. Good Father, we thank you, Lord, for being here. He's going to come and uh, do session three now. Does everybody have notes? If you need a set of notes, let me know. We have them in the back there. Everybody's covering. All right, Dr. Waite. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Pastor. Good to have you here again in our session. Uh, we're going to begin this afternoon with a look at the, the manuscripts, and especially the last 12 verses of Mark. <coughs> you know, uh, Dean Burgan has written an entire book called The Last 12 Verses of Mark. This is an important part of scripture, and I want to show how Dean Burgon mentions and shows how that uh, it's important. Uh, he's got a book that's, that's entitled The Last of Verse of Mark, and uh, first the manuscript evidence for and against. There are three things that determine what a Greek text is. Number one is manuscripts. Number two is early versions. What did they say? And then three, what did the quotations of the early church fathers, what did they say? So first of all, let's take a look at the manuscript evidence from Mark 16, 9 to 20. Now these verses are questioned in uh, Dr. Ryrie's study notes. They're questioned in the old uh, Schofield Reference Bible. They're questioned the New American Standard, New International Version, the English Standard Version, the other modern version, the Revised Standard, and so on. Uh, let's take a look at the evidence for them as far as the manuscripts are concerned, first of all. The manuscript evidence, uh, uh, Dean Burgon in his day, in the 1800s, uh, uh, the Codex B of the Vatican is against it. Uh, they leave it out. Codex Aleph is against it. They leave it out. Uh, but in favor of it, in his day, there were a total of 18 uncials, capital letter manuscripts that had Mark 16, 9 to 20. Where did they get it? Well, they got it because that was in the original Mark 16. Uh, there were about 600 cursive flowing hand manuscripts that have Mark 16, 9 to 20. And then every known uncial or cursive in existence except Codex B and Aleph. Those are the ones that leave it out. And every known lectionary in the East 
also has Mark 69 and 20. Lectionaries were parts of scriptures that were read in the churches. In certain days, it would be a certain number of verses and so on. And this was one of the lections that they read. So the manuscript evidence for Mark 69 to 20 is conclusive. Just because two leave it out, where would the others get it if it wasn't original? How could every one of them have it? How could 18 inches, couple of manuscripts, have it if it wasn't an original? Where did they get it? They just dream it up? They're all exactly the same. Where did the 600 curses get it? If it was just dreamed up, they dream up, well, 600, they're all the same? How can that happen? Impossible. It had to be in the originals. And uh, all the lectionaries read in the churches. And if this be true, if B and Al of Vatican time are in error here, how can you trust them anywhere else? That's what Dean Bergman is getting at. Very important. Now, let's take a look at uh, another group of ones. That is the early versions. Now, a version is an early translation. Uh, you notice in red, you have these first ten early, or first six rather, early versions that are preceding, 350 AD, preceding Vatican and Sinai. The Vatican and Sinai manuscripts are 350 AD or so, fourth century. And all of these early versions predated them. And uh, here's the Peshitta Syriac, 100-199 AD. That has Mark 69 to 20. Uh, the Vatisatara, the Old Latin has it. The Kyrotonian Syriac has it. Uh, the Sahidic Egyptian has it. The Amphitic Coptic Egyptian, the Gothic of Ophelis. All these are preceding Vatican and Sinai that dropped them out. Where did they get these verses, Mark 16, 9 to 20, the last four verses of Mark? All of them were the quotation, early versions, if they were not in existence. This is evidence before Vatican and Sinai ever saw the light of day. Those people who were Gnostics that hated some of the doctrines in Mark 16, 9 20, they wiped them out. They took them out. They, they, but these verses had it in, showing that they were in the original manuscripts of, of the Gospel of Mark. Now, the other versions came along after that, uh, Latin Vulgate and Phylixone, Syriac, and Ethiopic and Georgian. Uh, but there are ten ancient early translations that contain Mark 16, 9 to 20. And uh, that's an evidence. Here's the third type of evidence. Remember we said there are three types of evidence that show anything. It's the manuscript evidence, the early versions. Now here are the church fathers, early uh, writers in the early church. Now the church fathers had quotations now, and then they'd write letters back and forth. There were about 300 early church fathers that had a lot of writing and wrote many letters. Sometimes the letters were fighting with each other. And in those letters, they either quoted from a verse of Scripture or they alluded to a verse of Scripture. Either quotation. And there was these, these first ten of the 19, the first ten of the 19, all predate Vatican and Sinai manuscripts. The Vatican and Sinai, Vatican and Sinai, the B and Aleph, 350, all these 337, 80, right three, they all contained at least one of the verses of Mark 16, 9 to 20. Whether it's Papias, way back in 100 AD. Justin Martyr, 151, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Vincentius, Acta Pilati, Apostolic Constitution, Eusebius, Marinus, Aphratius the Persian. All of these predated, came before the Vatican Sinai manuscripts. Now I ask you the same question I asked you before. How could these church fathers quote from a verse of scripture that was not in existence? How could they do it? See? Now you say, well, how does Dean Burgon knew, how does he know that that was from Mark 16, 9, 20? He knows that because of his full, thorough knowledge of the Greek New Testament. That's the only place in the whole New Testament that contains these words, Mark 16, 9, 20, one of those verses. And so he pinpoints. If a church father, in fighting back and forth with one another, in writing, either alludes to a verse or quotes a verse from Mark 16, 9, 20, that shows its antiquity. It shows its early uh, admission and early use. It had it in his hands. It's the manuscript he had when he quoted from it. Now, we don't go along with all the doctrines of the church fathers. I want to make that crystal clear. Many of them are false teachers. They don't go along. They're apostates. That's not our purpose in using the quotation of the church fathers. Whether they're apostates or Bible believing church fathers, that's not the issue. The issue is, what did they have in their hands? when they quoted or alluded to Scripture. Did they have Mark 16, 9, and 20, or didn't they? See, if they had it in their hands, that means Mark 16, 9, and 20 was original. It was in the originals, and that's what we're using those church fathers for. Uh, there's a number of church fathers. 
uh, uh, Ambrose there and the dates are listed here and Chrysostom and Jerome and Augustine and Nestorius and Nestorius was a heretic. See? Uh, he quoted from that thing. Uh, as I say, we don't, we don't buy all their doctrines. But if they use the scripture, quote from the scripture, they had it in the Bible. It's showing the antiquity, the original. Cyrus of Alexandria, uh, Victor of Antioch, Hesychius, and so on. So these are church fathers that showed that back 69 to 20 was early. Now, uh, grouped by dates, uh, we see the 100 to 199, the second century, there were three church fathers that either quoted directly or alluded to the Mark 16, 9 to 20. Third century, 200 to 299, four church fathers. Fourth century, six church fathers quoted from or alluded. Fifth century, four church fathers. Sixth century, two church fathers. Five centuries, 19 early church fathers or writers quoted or alluded to Mark 16, 9 to 20. Which to me shows very conclusively that Mark 16, 9 to 20 was there in the original Bible. Very important uh, to see that. And why uh, these new versions leave it out or question it is questionable in, in my mind. Uh, then uh, <clears throat> we have a total. I call this the battleground. The battleground, uh, WH means West Cotton Hort changes in the text receptors. Uh, that's the battleground. I went through the book there, which is Dr. Scrivener's book, the Greek New Testament, I guess I forgot to bring it up here, but uh, if you want to. Uh, I went through Dr. Scrivener's book before we really published it and printed it, a Greek New Testament of Dean Bergon, or, or of uh, Dr. Scrivener, and I counted up a total number of uh, changes in those, those words. Uh, the Texture Slippers has about 140,000 uh, verses altogether. Uh, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong. Let's see, wait a minute. Uh, oh, oh well, let me go back one. Uh, yes, I, I skipped one. All right, let me back up. Thank you. All right, okay. Uh, we have a total of 140,521 uh, words in the text receptors that underlies our King James Bible. That's a received text. Uh, that's about 647 pages. Uh, thanks, honey. And uh, about 217 words per page. Now, that's what we have in our text receptors. That's the background. Now, let me go on to the next slide. I guess I did skip one. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, the next one, now, what do they change? What's got more changes in these, uh, this text receptor? I had the, the uh, Scrivener's Greek New Testament, which is this one here, and uh, I was at a Bible conference in the summertime. My wife wasn't with me, so I had a little extra time to study. <laughs> uh, not that I would wish she had been there, but she wasn't. And so I went through all the places. See, the, uh, Scrivener was told to make a, a New Testament Greek text that exactly underlies the King James Bible. What the text that they used. When there's a variation, you put it in black letters. And so he put in black letters the changes, and then in the footnotes, how did West Cotton Hort change the Greek New Testament? And so I had this before me. I went through every page, and uh, I found a total of, as we say right there, <coughs> a total of 5,604 places where the black marks, the black notes, uh, bold letters, where that Greek word is changed by West Cotton Hort. And then in the footnotes, I counted the number of, of words that they either added or subtracted. And I got a total of 9,970 Greek words that they've added or subtracted. Now that's 15.4 words per page. You put all those changes together. Not that you put them together, but if you put them all together, that average is 15 words a page of their Greek New Testament, they changed. And uh, that's about 7% of the total words. That would be, if you put them all together, that's 45.9 pages of changes in the West Garden Hort Greek text. So that's the battleground that we have before us. Now, Dr. Mormon has done some extra research and detail on the thing, and uh, he came out with a book called 8,000 Differences which are the Inbergen Society and our Bible for Day, half and half, we've published this book. Uh, it goes through here and shows uh, the Texas Receptus uh, and the English translation, and then the uh, critical text, Nesalala critical text, and their translation. Now, some of these changes, these 8,000 changes, are major, some are minor, uh, but they're changes in the Greek text. Some you can't even tell in the translation, but they're changes. He counted it as a change. Spelling changes, what are 8,000 total changes. Uh, that we have that's available if you want it over there uh, as well. 
So uh, that's an important thing that we should remember. And then uh, this is what it looks like as we showed over there, that picture. And it shows that uh, Dean Berger, that uh, Dr. Mark Mormon, he's one of our greatest scholars in our whole movement on the textual matters. He's written quite a few books. We've published, I think, five or six of his books, our Bible for the Ministry has. And this is one of his best, uh, among other things. It shows the differences between the two texts. And some people, you know, some are Bible-believing Christians that are fundamentalists in their schools. They say, oh, there's not much difference in these two Greek texts. They say if a student, in fact, uh, one of the professors at the Bible Jones said in a debate, he said if an average student would open up his Greek New Testament in class, he wouldn't even notice there's any difference, whether it's a received text or something that's analyzed the King James Bible or the critical text. He wouldn't even know that. That was the plain down the differences. That's why a scholar such as Dr. Jack Mormon of London, England, one of our church's missionaries, has done this exhaustive research. Can you imagine the time it would take to go through every single word of the Greek New Testament and compare the text receptus Greek with the critical text Greek? Uh, that's why he's done a tremendous job to show that there's differences, and they're very important differences indeed. <clears throat> then also Dr. Mormon has written another book, which we've published, and that's called Missing in Modern Bibles. Uh, it is the full story being told. Uh, and he found out that if you take all the chapters of all the books of the Bible, compare the Nestle Greek text or the, uh, well, the United Bible Society text, the Nestle Island text, critical text, is 2,886 Greek words shorter than the received text. Just count them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, total words here, total words there. It's shorter. What happened to those words? They took them out. Why did they take them out? Probably because they were Gnostics that had a theological difference and they could have used that. But if you put those together, uh, if you put all those uh, 2,886 words in the English Bible, it would be the equivalent of dropping out the entire books of First and Second Peter, uh, five chapters in uh, First Peter and three chapters in Second Peter. Sometimes I used to uh, take those pages and to pour them, I just lift them all up all the way down to the floor. That's the difference between the texts that underlie modern versions and a King James Bible's text. It's a tremendous difference. There's no question about it. And I'll go, refer to Herman Hoske once again. He's got a two-volume uh, Codex B and It's Alive. And he compared Vatican B and Aleph. And notice what he found. He said he showed these two corrupt manuscripts to be in contradiction one with the other in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone. In other words, if B is right, Aleph is wrong. If Aleph is right, B is wrong. It's quite possible in those instances that neither B and Aleph is correct. And so, uh, just imagine that. Remember, we talked about Mark 16, 9-20. We said Vatican Sinai, B and Aleph, those two manuscripts on which the new versions are based, are the only two that dropped them out. There are 18 anchos, capital letter manuscripts that have Mark 16, 9-20, over 600 curses, all the lectionaries read in the churches, only these two. You can't trust the two. <laughs> if you can't trust them in Mark 16, 9, 12, where can you trust them? And now we see from uh, Dr. Herman Hosker's book that even in the four Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over 3,000 places where they're at odds. What does Russell Westcott Hort do? What do they do? Well, they have to take one or the other. You can't take both because they're contradictory in these places. They favor B, or the Vatican manuscript. That's what they worship. If Sinai differs, they pick some of the manuscript that agrees with B, and they go with that. See, completely, totally uh, taken up with the wrong manuscripts. <clears throat> now, uh, I was in a meeting in New Jersey several years ago, and uh, I was going before the deacons of a church. The pastor asked me to come and uh, tell them why they should continue to stay with the King James Bible. Uh, because the, the school was trying to change them into the new international version. Pastors took the King James. So uh, he invited somebody from the Grand Rapids uh, Theological Center, now it's called something else, to come down and present their side, to tear apart the King James in the text. I'm coming down to defend it. And, uh, well, they didn't want to come first. They wanted me to go first. So I went first. They came second, but they didn't send just one. They sent two men down. <laughs> then I said, I'd like to know what they said so I can figure out and ref refute it. 
refused. They would not tell what those men said. They wouldn't give me anything when they said that I confused. Strange, isn't it? If they have the truth, why, why don't they broadcast the truth to some fellow that disagrees with them? Anyway, one of the deacons asked me this. Says, uh, Dr. Ray said, uh, do you have any history of the traditional text, text receptors, down through the quarters of time that this was accepted historically? I said, no, sir, I don't, but I went home and I, I found some things. <laughs> this is what I found. I found that there were a total of 37 historical links, chain of evidence, from the beginning of the apostolic age right down to the present that used the traditional text. One thing you could do for those that go with the critical text is ask them that same question that was asked me. Sirs, do you have a continuity of people down from the apostolic times right down to the present that used your false critical text? See what they say. If they say they go home and find out, let them go home and find out. They can't find out. There's no text. There's no historical. It's not there. There is a historical showing that the words similar to the King James Bible right down uh, to the course of history. Here's uh, the evidence of the apostolic age, 33 to 100. Apostolic churches use the perceived kind of text. The churches of Palestine use the perceived kind of text. The Syrian church in Antioch uh, use the received kind of text. Uh, in the historical evidence is in the received text for the early church period, 100 to 312. The Pursuit of Syriac, 150 AD, used the received kind of text. I say received kind of text because, you know, there may be differences in translation, different things, but the kind, not the critical text, which is very clearly a distinction of it. <clears throat> the Papyrus 66 used the received kind of text. The Italic Church of very early, 157 AD, used the received kind of text. <clears throat> then the Gallic Church of uh, southern uh, France, 177 AD used the received kind of text. The Celtic or Celtic Church, Great Britain, used the received kind of text. The Church of Scotland and Ireland received kind of text. pre waldensian churches used it. The Waldensian Church, 120 AD used and onward to received a kind of text. Uh, the evidence is now in the uh, received text for the Byzantine period of the church, 312 to 4, 1453. The Gothic version of the 4th century used it. Codex B of Matthew used it. Codex A of the Gospels used it. The vast majority of extant New Testament manuscripts used the received kind of text. About 99% of them, or 5,210 out of 5,255, as of 1967, used it. We mentioned that this morning. 99% of the manuscripts used it. This is a historic picture. Those are the first 15. Well, let's keep going on the thing. Uh, historical evidence for the received text in the Byzantine period. Again, uh, the Greek, the 16th of the Greek Orthodox Church used it. The present Greek Orthodox Church still uses the received kind of text. My mom sent Mrs. Ray to me over to Israel in the 1980s. And mom said, you ought to go there, son. I didn't have any idea to want to go anywhere. <laughs> she sent us over there, so we went. And one of the things they sent us to is the birth of Jesus, the place where he was born. You never know it now. I mean, they got a huge, big Greek Orthodox church towering over them, <laughs> two or three stories high. And then they go down the basement. They said, that's where he was born, see. Can't prove it. Other people say it was born over here. <laughs> they got all different places where he was born, different places where he died. Anyway, I, I looked at a big bearded man with a big robe in that ante room when we entered that church, the Greek Orthodox Church. He wrote Church of the Nativity, that's what it's called. I said, Sir, uh, are you a pastor of this church? Yes. Greek Orthodox minister. I asked him this question. I said, uh, In your Bible, what type of a text, Greek text, do you use? Have you heard of the name Westcott and Hort? Do you use that kind of thing? Oh, no, he's heard about that all right. We do not use that. He knew that his church and his New Testament and the Greek Orthodox Church, we don't agree with all the Greek Orthodox doctrines, don't get me wrong, but they got the received text Bible, same as we have in the King James. They still use it. And that old bearded, bearded uh, man knew what he was talking about. I, I was shocked that he heard of West Hill all the way over in, in Jerusalem. See? Well, that's what he did. <laughs> so, uh, they still use it. Then the historical evidence is for C. that during the early modern period, 1543 to 1831. Uh, the Church of the Reformation all used received kind of text. The Erasmus Greek Testament used it, 1516. Comprehensive Paragraph, 1522. Martin Luther's German Bible used it, 1522. Received kind of a text. <clears throat> Historical evidence again, uh, uh, William Tyndale used it, 1525. French version of Olivetown, 1535 used it. Coverdale Bible used it. Matthew's Bible, 1537. 
these are historical links of the use of the received text that underlies the King James Bible. The Taverns Bible, 1539, the Great Bible, 1539, the Stephanus text, 1516, uh, the Geneva Bible, uh, 1557, the Bishop's Bible, 1516, all of them use the received kind of text. Uh, continuing, the Spanish version in 1569 used the received kind of text, the Beza Greek New Testament, 1598, that's the text on which our King James is based, by the way, 1598 Beza. Uh, the Czech version, 1602 used it. The Italian version, the Adopti, 1607 used it. <coughs> the uh, King James Bible itself used it. The Hallsville Brothers, uh, later on, 1624 used it. The received text of the King James uh, Bible, the New Testament, is the original received kind of text. Now, a lot of people say the Hallsville version, see, that came in 1624 and 1611. In that version, 1624, which would be uh, 13 years later, than the King James, in the preface uh, of the Elzer, not the Elzer, yeah, Elzer text, it talks about the text that was received by all. Textum or kectum by omnibus received. In the Latin phrase, this is the text received by all. And the words textus receptus are used. So some of our fundamentalist brethren and others say, well, that's when the text receptus originated, in 1624. And therefore, how could the King James Bible be quoted or, or translated from the text receptus if it was not in existence until 13 years later. The fallacy that our brethren use in that is that just because the preface of the, the Elzebra Greek text quotes in Latin, this is a text that was received by all. Doesn't mean that's the beginning of the received text. It was a text that has been received by all. And that's exactly what it is. They say, well, they use text for something, therefore it's not there. No. These, this chain of evidence, this 37 links, historical links, shows that we have a pedigree down to the quarters of time. We didn't just pick it up and just say, well, that's it, and uh, 1611 we had to go with it and so on. But this is historical evidence. And so I'm glad that man asked me the question. So sometimes people ask questions, we're glad to answer questions, and that's the way it goes. But uh, that uh, stirred me to go ahead and try to get some evidence, and that was the evidence. But again, you ask some of the people, give me the historic continuity, 37 or however many links, to your critical text of Vatican Sinai from the beginning of the local to the churches down to the present. There's zero. They come maybe up to about 450 A.D., that's it. Remember we quoted that verse, that, that, that section from, uh, from uh, Scrivener, or not Scrivener, uh, Hoskier, where he says that, that this was a received, it was a doctored or a corrected Greek text from 200 to 450 A.D., and then it stopped. The church has stopped using it, see? Historically, there's no evidences how this chain of events. And Westcott Hall, who lived in 1881, had to go way back and pick up from the garbage heap Vatican Sinai Greek manuscripts that the churches had rejected for almost 1,500 years. And they picked that thing up out of the garbage heap that the churches knew to be false and exalted it to the throne of righteousness and perfection. Absolutely. And they said, these be thy gods that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. These are the ones we ought to worship. And the problem is that Bishop... Westcott and Professor Hort, especially Professor Hort, in writing the introduction to their Greek text, was so clever that it convinced the men of their day that that was the way to go. It took over England. Now, Dean Burgon was there, the same church they were, Church of England. He wrote books against them. We've reprinted five of them, our Dean Burgon Society. But he convinced the whole churches in England and France and Germany came over to this country, uh, the Princeton Seminary bought that thing, West Coast North's way to go, Dallas Seminary, my seminary bought it, Southern Baptist and Louisville bought it, it just swept the whole world. And yet, the introduction to the West Coast North Greek text was filled with hypotheses, not evidence, not fact, guesswork. But it, it snowed them all, as we say, and convinced them all. It's almost like the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 gave them strong delusion to believe a lie. Strong delusion to believe a lie. And this is a sad thing indeed. Well, the totals 
if we add them up, for and against the New Testament manuscripts, as I said, in 1967, there were 5,255. I'm just using these statistics. The others, I'm sure, will be proportional. They've got about 300 more since then. But the papyrus, that part of the papyrus plant that's in Egypt, about 81 to 88 uh, were total in that day. A number of manuscripts of West Garden Hort over here, and Texas Receptus over here. 13 West Garden Hort, 75 Texas Receptus. 15% against 85%. That's the papyri. That's the early things. You from a plant just like a paper, and you write it on there. They, not too many of them. The Anshuls, these are capital letters manuscripts, capital letter manuscripts, and all of them run together with no punctuation, no, no spaces between the words. You just write straight on all caps, no good. There's a total of those of 267. Now, West Garden Hort had nine of these, Vatican and Sinai are two that are going along with West Garden Hort decks, but 258 of them are Texas Receptus manuscripts. The percentage is that's 3% to West Garden Hort, 97% Texas Receptus. You see, they're completely outnumbered, but they still say they're right and we're wrong, see. I don't understand the logic of it. Uh, Cursive, flowing hand manuscripts, 2,764. Uh, West Garden Hort had 23 of them. The Texas Receptus, 2,741. That's 1% versus 99%. The lectionaries, those are portions of scripture read in the churches, remember. Every certain feast days I read it. In fact, Mark 16, 9 to 20, it was a lection read at the time of Easter, in that, in that season of the year. Uh, zero for West Conroe. There wasn't a single lection I read in the churches. All 2,143 text receptors. At 0% to 100%. It totaled them all up. So they had 5,000, they had 45, Vatican, China, and 43 others against 5,210, less than 1% versus 99%. That's the scoreboard of manuscripts. Now you say, well, if that's the case, if the modern versions have less than 1% of the evidence, manuscript evidence that God has preserved to this day, and our received text that underlies our King James Bible has over 99% of the evidence God has preserved to this day, why do they go with the 1%, less than 1%? They'd have to have 53, 52 to be 1%. They only got 45, how many got 1%? The reason is the ingeniousness, devilishness of Professor Hort in writing his introduction to the Great New Testament. It just, he said this and this, didn't, all these things that are not true, not things they believe a lie. And that's why they say, they say that, uh, oh, uh, Vatican China are older. Does the old necessarily mean the best? Because you remember the heretics, knives, Dr. Scrivener and Dean Burgon both have said the greatest number of heresies that existed and perversions were in the first hundred years after the King James, after the Bible, New Testament originated. And the knives of the heretics changed this, changed that. And so the Vatican Sinai, they were the older manuscripts, they're the product of Gnostic heretical changes and should not be followed. Well, uh, we go over now to the chapter in our Defending the King James Bible, chapter 3. The King James Bible is God's words, kept intact in English, because of its superior translators. Uh, there are men today that say that uh, these translators are no, no account and they shouldn't be followed, and uh, that's not the case. Uh, these men are thoroughly qualified, as we'll see, for instance, uh, Lancelot Andrews. Uh, he was president of the director of the Westminster Group of Churches, uh, of the, the translators, rather, and uh, translated the first 12 books from Genesis to Second Kings. That was company number one. What about Lancelot Andrews? What, was, what, what did he know about things? Well, he first of all acquired most of the modern languages of Europe. That's just something he kind of gave himself to the Oriental tongues. And this is from Translators Revived by Alexander McClure. So that was one thing about Lancelot Andrews. Secondly, he had a manual for private devotions wholly in the Greek language. Now, I'm sure that many of our brethren that translated the NIV, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, or Vice Standard Version, uh, many of them are competent in the languages. I want someone to tell me, I've always asked this wherever I go, please tell me, if you know of any, that have a devotional commentary wholly in the Greek language. 
And I've never had anybody write me. I mean, I've opened it up. I'm not trying to hide anything. If I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. Here's one man that's written an entire manual of devotion in the Greek language. I majored in classical Greek and Koine Greek and New Testament. Many hours <laughs> of Greek. I wouldn't begin to do this. The, the majesty, the accomplishments of these translators are something that can't be imitated by these brethren today, even though they'd like to think that they're better than these. These men are no good. They can't do what they're doing. Uh, don't believe them. <clears throat> in fact, uh, someone said such was the skill in all languages, especially only had it been present at the Confucian tongues of Babel, he might have served as interpreter general. That's Lancelot Andrews. He's one of the committee men. A tremendous scholar indeed. Here's, uh, again, fourth at his funeral sermon, uh, Dr. Buckridge, Buckridge uh, Bishop of Rochester, so the Dr. Andrews was conversant with 15 languages. Uh, our translators are superior to the ones today. I don't know any of the 15. There may be three or four, or three or four languages. That's fine. 15? <laughs> Bring them on. I'd like to talk to the man. Uh, superiority of uh, William Bedwell. Here's a second man. Uh, Dr. Bedwell is another translator and uh, talks about his acumen, his knowledge. He translated the books, Genesis through Second Kings. First, he was a, an or, an eminent Oriental scholar. Eminent Oriental scholar, that's the first thing about him. Second, his fame for Arabic learning. Now, Arabic is a, is a sister language to Hebrew, the Old Testament Hebrew. And uh, he was great. And in fact, uh, he promoted and revived the study of Arabic language and literature in Europe. He was a great a student of that. <clears throat> in fact, uh, he published the epistles of John in Arabic with a Latin version. And fourthly, he left many Arabic manuscripts. The man asked me the other earlier today about the uh, about the uh, Arabic and the Aramaic, and they used that as the Latin version. They published it. He left many Arabic manuscripts. In fact, he was engaged in compiling an Arabic lexicon in three volumes. Uh, a man of no mean understanding of language. Uh, Dr. Budwell also uh, was a student of many cognate or sister languages, Semitic languages. And uh, some modern scholars, and that is 1857 when McClure wrote the book, fancy they have an advantage in our times uh, by reason of greater attention to the supposed uh, cognate or sister languages. But the Bible was still a conversant with sister languages. You know sister languages. You have Spanish, you have Italian, you have Latin. These are sister, these are cognate sister languages and very similar. I can speak to someone in Spanish and uh, they can understand in Italian. They could speak to me in Italian. I can understand because they're Spanish. <laughs> they're sister language, and they knew this. It's important. Sometimes in the Old Testament, there's people who say, well, uh, I don't know what this means. This word is very faint. I don't know. The King James Bible translators knew the sister languages where the same root was used. They knew exactly what the Hebrew root is. These fellows today, they say, well, this is an unknown meaning. We don't know what this is. These are especially when that's what they call a hotbox legononym. Word used only once. Hebrew or Greek word used only once in the whole Bible. Hapax, once, legomenon, once spoken, once written. And they said, we don't know what this is, just use one time. The King James translators knew what that was because they had a, a grasp for the sister languages and they knew what those were in the same root and the same spelling, they would carry it over. Eminent uh, scholar indeed. And then uh, he was began his, his Persian dictionary. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Uh, and he was in his Arabic, Persian, other way, and I was greatly superior to our modern translators. Indeed he was. Now, you know what Persian, now that's another uh, sister language to the Hebrew. I'm sure all of you have heard of Persian rugs. You know, it's very, very good rack for rugs. I'm sure you've some of you heard of Persian cats. But to have a Persian dictionary... And I, was, I don't know that sort of an unknown thing. See, but this man, scholar that he was, had a Persian dictionary, a sister language indeed that was helpful. Then the spirit of Dr. Miles Smith. Uh, he was also one of the translators. And uh, he was. Uh, did I miss one? No, oh, yeah, I did miss one. Uh, he's the Arabic learning. That's pretty well. Let me see here. Did I miss one? I, I'm on Smith now? Okay. Okay, i got to get caught up in myself. All right. Except for William Miles Smith, he was translated a total of 17 books from Isaiah through Malachi. That's where he was. He was one of the 12 translators that selected to revise the work. He's one of the advisors. 
that we'll see at the end of the time they picked two from each of the six companies, 12 men, to revise and go over the overall picture. He was one that was there. Uh, he wrote the, the preface to the King James Bible, and that was important to see that he was uh, learning that. We're going to stop right here, but we have some questions at this point. If you have, uh, let's take some questions. Yes, sir, Pastor. Your time in seminary, what you may be familiar with was Paul's seminary. Do they study time exactly uh, the introduction of the Westcott Bush introduction to the Westcott Bush? To spend time investigating the introduction to the Westcott Bush of Dr. Hort. No, they didn't at Dallas Seminary. I don't know that they'd do it others. I think they go beyond that. In other words, Professor Hort wrote that in order to convince people that his text would change the text receptus in these 8,000 places was superior. They just accepted it as gospel. They never went through with it. If they went through now that's one thing Dean Bergen did do. He went back to that introduction. He tore it apart logically, reasonably, and with documentation of facts. Now, he's done that in the, the revision revised. He's done that somewhat in his traditional text, causes of corruption of the traditional text. Uh, these, in the last four verses of Mark, he's done that, torn it apart. Our Bible for Day ministry has reprinted that introduction, not because we agree with it, but because we want people to see what it is. So when Dean Burgon quotes from it, you see it's accurately quoted. And it's a, it's a mess, uh, with theologically and philosophically, but it sounds good. Yes, Pastor? So, they, so basically what's done is they'll accept the truth of their study, but not accept the method of their study. That's right. They have the fruit, but not the method. They don't go into the method. <clears throat> now, Different things that, that he put out, put forth in that. Uh, further, he said certainly canons of criticism. That's one of the things he'd have in the introduction. They do go into canons of criticism. That means what are the standards of criticizing uh, different Greek manuscripts. Let me give you a few of them. I don't remember all six or seven canons, but I'll give you a few. First of all, Wes Gardner said you only accept the Greek text that is the earliest. Well, Vatican sign our earliest. Accept them. <laughs> Secondly, I always accept the shorter text rather than the longer one. Well, Vatican Sinai was shorter. Chalk that up. All right. Third canon, I always accept a text that has difficulties, things that don't make sense. Because, you know, if you correct it, it makes sense, that couldn't be the right one. That's West Cotton Hort's being out of again. Don't make sense. <laughs> There's several other canons. <laughs> now, I liken this, the canons that they concocted, as a treasure hunt. I've always used the illustration. I've been on treasure hunts from time to time. You've been on treasure hunts. <coughs> you get the first chord, the first place you go there, and have a, you have a key to go to the second uh, stage, and the third stage, and the fourth stage, and finally get the treasure, see. All these canons of criticism were concocted by Bishop Westcott and Professor Hort to get to their treasure. Every one of these leads the Vatican and Sinai manuscript. It's, it's, I mean, it's just plain logic, but all of these people just go wild over these canons of criticism. I've never seen anything like it. See, I look at them. See, they, they, this leads, well, that's, we've got the right text because all these canons, but who made the canons up? Westcott and Hort. For what purpose? To lead to their treasure. <laughs> Circular reasoning. That's good. That's it. <laughs> all right, another question. Yes, sir. Three things. Number one, if I can remember them, <laughs> was the uh, what was the first one yet? Why is it the first? Oh, why is it reprinted? Well, it's reprinted in some King James Bibles. I guess one reason that we didn't reprint it in our defined King James Bible, although some people ask us, uh, it's long, it's lengthy, it takes more time and space, and so on. And uh, some of the things in the preface to the reader, I don't agree with. These guys are wrong. See, they're Church of England. I'm a Baptist. See, there's a lot of things that they believe that the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, was, was B.C. I don't believe a word of it. It's A.D., see. 
It's in the fifth column of uh, Origins Hexapro, 200 A.D. See, they can't prove that it's... A, in other words, there are a number of things. Uh, they thought the things were all right. They quoted things. So uh, I'm glad it's not put in there. I'm not trying to be hostile to the fellows, but they're not perfect. See, the second question is the Apocrypha. Why did they put the Apocrypha? They were, were urged against it. People it warned them, don't put that thing in. It's junk. It's no good. It's got contradicts the Scripture. Never said it was inspired. <laughs> These 10 or 12, uh, 14 different books. Well, they didn't listen. I'm against that, see. I cannot defend the errors of the translators. I will defend their translation when they're exactly done a good job, but not their errors, see. They never should have done that. That's one of the things, the main reason why I go against the followers of Dr. Peter Ruckman, the Ruckmanites, who say that these are the original 1611, were God's word breathed out, revealed word by word by the Holy Spirit. If that be true, you've got God committing evil and wickedness and sinfulness by putting out a pocket in there. See? That's the thing I go against these, these Ruckmanites constantly. They can't say that. See? It's the best translation of the inspired and unifiable Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic words and the riot. Those are the inspired God-breathed words, uh, not the not the King James. So I, I say that. And there's a third question, I think, part of What was that third one? Oh, yeah. The good, even better. They used the Bishop's Bible and the Great Bible, and uh, they used that to, to see what they said. They used a lot of the words of the Tyndale, some people said maybe 90, 95 percent of Tyndale's words. But they looked at him to see, is that what our Greek text says? If it's what it says, we we'll use it. I mean, there's only so many words in the English language, and sometimes they did use it, see. And they want to make it better, because as I said before this morning, and John Reynolds, who was a, he was a uh, uh, what do you call those people, strict people, Puritan, he was a Puritan. And he was in the Church of England, but he was a Puritan. And he didn't go along with a lot of things that were going on in that big church. He wanted to reform them in many ways. In fact, the pilgrims were pure as they came over there to escape this church. But uh, John Mayles never said, May Her Majesty be pleased that a new translation be made. The versions extant, that is, in existence today, not answering to the originals. So they went along as far as they could with those extant, but make it even better. Exactly. They wanted to translate what God has given to us in His words. Other question. Yes, sir. You mentioned the story about Bob Jones being uh, against the position of the Texas Receptus. Do they generally try to refute the works of Gordon, Hoskia, and Scrivener, or do they tend to more ignore it? Right, to these schools that are against the Texas Receptus refute, uh, Scrivener and Hoskia uh, are just ignored. I think they mostly ignore it. I don't think they go after these things and don't. They just uh, assume that the arguments against it never exist. I think that's basically what, what happens. Uh, they, uh, they just teach that that's what the, the Bible is, just like in Dallas Center when they taught me. They just <laughs> In the bookstore, you have to buy a Greek text. If you're going to study Greek, go in the bookstore, and uh, the Greek text they gave us was Westcott and Hort's text. They didn't say anything. I uh, took the Greek class, and they didn't say anything there. It's the rest of, we just we assumed that was the Bible. That was the Greek New Testament. No questions. They didn't refute this, refute that. They didn't have to. They put it in their hands. As far as they were concerned as a school, that was the same way with Bob Jones. Uh, in about 1950s, a man by the name of Ernie, his name was... Yeah, yeah. Uh, not Warfield, but... Breckenridge, yeah, Breck, Dr. Breckenridge. Was it Breckenridge? No, not Breckenridge. It was. Was it? No. The someone came to Dallas. He to to to, uh, to Bob Jones. Uh, not Breckenridge, but I can't think of his name. I wish I could. Uh, anyway, he was this man that came to Bob Jones University to to indoctrinate them into the West Hort false Greek text. He had. I can't even think of that. He was trained at, at Princeton Theological Seminary. Breckenridge. It's very close to Breckenridge. Maybe it was Breckenridge. I think it might be Breckenridge. If it's not right, we'll correct it some other time. I think it's Breckenridge. I think it was. Anyway, he was trained at, at Princeton and under B.B. Warfield. And B.B. Warfield was trained over in England with Westcott and Hort. 
and the critical text. And so Warfield brought to Princeton the white critical text. Then this man, whatever his name was, <laughs> he brought that training to Bob Jones. And from 1950s on, they were solid critical texts. No questions about it. And they just moved on. So they, they didn't refute these. They just didn't tell the students. I don't believe they even got into them. See, that would make a division. All right. Time for one more question. Then we'll take ten for relaxation. No, I don't think so. Honey. Any question? Saving them up for next hour. Pastor, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank right. you. We have uh, about ten minutes. Uh, you can stand and stretch if you need to use the restroom downstairs. Walk around and stretch and maybe take a look at some of the books. And we'll get started uh, with a hymn at about 2 o'clock. You can tell uh, this, Pastor, if you want. Yeah. Let me just turn on my sound system here. Excuse me, I guess I should have done that before. All right, I guess we're ready to, to begin. Uh, last uh, session we talked about the superiority of these King James Bible translators, and I think you can see from that that they, they're strong, they uh, held to what they should hold to, and uh, I don't know where we had Miles Smith, I guess we did Miles Smith. I'll right, we'll go to the next one then, and uh, that one you'll see is also, uh, well, still Miles Smith. Our right, third, uh, he went through all the Greek and Latin fathers, making his annotation on them. Uh, he was, you see, there was about 100 church fathers that were extensively from 100 to 300, 200 more from 300 to 600. So there are a total then of 300 of these early church fathers, and he went through all of them. Scholar in Latin, scholar in Greek, uh, really well one. Then he was well acquainted with the rabbinical glosses and comments. So he knew his Hebrew language, those things that they put in the margins as to what they should do in corrections. So he's a man that uh, knew what he was they're talking about. And then also, uh, he was expert in the Chaldee, which is akin to the Hebrew, related to it, the Syriac and the Arabic. These are always almost as familiar as his native tongue. Those are Chaldee, those are sister or cognate languages. We call sister to Hebrew, so he could figure it out. Hebrew, he had at his fingers' ends. It's extremely superior, qualified to translate our King James Bible. Superiority of Miles Smith. Then we have another man called Henry Seville. Uh, Sir Henry Seville translated the histories of Cornelius Tacitus, which was Latin, and published. He was uh, published the, the manuscripts of Bodwetti uh, against Pelagius and the writers of English history, subsequent to Vita, and the prelections of elements of Euclid. He was a quick, a terrific, a terrific translator and knowledgeable in the Latin as well as the Greek languages, and uh, famous for his, uh, his abilities. Uh, Let's see, did I get to, I skipped one on mine. Okay, let's back up. Oh, yes, six books of gospels. It's Henry Seville, okay. Yeah, we forgot Henry. Sir Henry, all right. The six books, gospels, Acts, Revelation. He became very well, famous for his Greek and mathematical learning. Notice this point here. He was the tutor in Greek and mathematics for Queen Elizabeth. Well, I know you know and I know you don't just get some better off the street to teach the queen <laughs> the language, various other things in mathematics, and in Greek. So he was used in that capacity as well. Uh, we, we, we got that one there, okay. Sometimes I miss these things. Uh, then fifth, uh, he was the first to edit and complete the work of Chrysostom, the most famous of the Greek uh, church fathers. Uh, many pages and many editions, 1,000 copies was made in 1613, eight big uh, folio volumes. So he was uh, no mean person. And uh, he certainly, uh, the last thing about him was uh, he was a profound, exact critical scholar of his age, meet and write, as McClure noted, to take part in the preparation of the incomparable version of King James Version. So these are some translators of King James Version. One more translator, the fifth one, and that's uh, John Boyce. Uh, John Boyce is known for his skill. He translated the Apocrypha. We talked about that, why we we're against it, why we don't believe it should have been in there, but it was in there. If you want an accurate translation of the Apocrypha, John Boyce did it. 
That's if you want real accuracy. Real solid, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not interested, but if you want to find a solid one, go to John Boyce and the early 1611 King James Bible. He was carefully taught by his father. I'm, I'm for homeschooling. Several of our children, grandchildren, uh, and some of our great-grandchildren will be taught and, and, uh, by the homeschooling method. Uh, and uh, notice, uh, he's a child prodigy. At the age of five years, he had read the Bible in Hebrew. Now, most children, if they're different than mine, <laughs> four sons and a daughter, didn't even read English at the age of five. Hebrew? Are you kidding? Uh, this was a precocious young man. Let's put it mildly to say that. Uh, this is one of our translators. He was uh, six years. He wrote the Hebrew in legible characters. If you don't think about writing Hebrew, it's difficult to make yourself known. I have trouble even in English <laughs> making myself known, but he wrote it legibly in a fair and elegant character. He distinguished himself both in his great skill in Greek. Notice what he did in Greek, writing letters in that language to the master and senior fellows at his college. Uh, it's one thing to write in English, but to write in Greek, I realize it's modern Greek. This is classical Greek, and this biblical Greek, Koine Greek, and it's a little difficult situation to do that, but he was a master at it and could write letters back and forth in that language. Uh, then, uh, in the chambers of Dr. Down, he was his teacher, uh, he would read, read with him 12 Greek authors in prose, the hardest that could be found, dialect and phrase. And notice his studiousness. As a young man, he would read and study the university library at 4, hours, 4 a.m., staying without intermission until 8 in the evening, 16 hours straight, a tremendous scholar and student. Let's say something about Dr. Down and the university lecture in his Greek, lecture, his Greek uh, language. I was just a, just a freshman, and all of my knowledge about Greek is when that's what I began in the University of Michigan, classical Greek. And Dr. Uh, what's his name for him? Dr. was, uh, whatever, this man was my teacher. He was, a, he was a, the head of man of the ancient language department. Uh, Blake was his name, Dr. Ron E. Blake. Somebody asked me this last week, would you give me some of your experiences with Dr. Blake? I guess I mentioned that sometime in one of my studies or lectures or whatever. And, so I, I told him the best I knew. But anyway, at one time I was reading, the, uh, I don't know what we were reading, but I had had Spanish in high school, Spanish in college, but no Latin. Yeah, I had Latin in college, but not in the, in the language, the, the, the uh, high school. So this was my first experience with a hard, tough language. I remember Dr. Blake, when I'd recite, whether we were reading Plato's Apology or Homer's, Homer's uh, uh, lesson, whatever the subject, whatever we were translating. I'd go to the library. I'd try to get some what they call ponies, some things that give me a hint as to what this Greek meant before we went to class. And invariably I found no help at all. They were all dynamic equivalencies, all just adding and subtracting. But when you use one of those translations, Dr. Blake would be so angry at that because it has nothing to do with what the Greek said. I remember one time when I finished translating, there were only about six or eight in the class. It's a small class. Anybody that uh, majors in classical Greek, you know, are few and far between, even in University of Michigan, which is a big school. So I finished translating. I'll never forget how Dr. Blake uh, had a deep sigh. He didn't say anything. He just sighed. I knew what he meant. I did a horrible job. Not so was John Boyce. But the hardest Greek that could be made sailed through. Tremendous giant in the stomach. This is not an easy subject of the language of the Greek, believe me. But uh, I got better as we went through. You know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> that was my first. I was a primer. That was the first Greek class I ever had. I was studying for uh, pre-medical work. I felt I was going to be a doctor. Got in, involved with Dr. Amadi Han, who was formerly a doctor, and in his Bible studies every uh, Friday night at, uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, over to Detroit. And uh, the Lord called me to the ministry. And so I was for science and all these other things. I got into this Greek class. They had to have it at Dallas. I thought I was going to go to Dallas. Dr. DeHaan recommended it as a good solid school. Of course, it didn't have the right Greek department. But, uh, and so to go to Dallas, you had to have eight semester hours of Greek. And if you went there, you had to take it without any credit. 
I said, well, if I got a ticket to write credit, I might as well start here. So I started majoring in classical Greek. That's how I got into that. That's a long story. I'm sorry about that nonsense. But anyway, uh, the superiority of John Boyce, complete costly collection. He's got one of the most complete and costly collections uh, in the Greek literature that's ever been made. A tremendous scholar in his library. He equally dis uh, distinguished for his skill in Greek and Hebrew, both. He was one of the 12 translators who were two from each company to make the final revision at Stationers Hall in London. A uh, tremendous scholar he was and completely fit to be one of our translators. Then uh, we go over to the final thing for John Boyce. Uh, he took notes of the proceedings uh, in the committee, this final committee. So you see they had six different companies. And uh, two from each company went to the final time. It took them about nine months to go over it completely. They everything from top to bottom. Uh, he took notes of that. And his notes, by the way, are some early evidence is the only ones we have of how they went about their translating. Translators revived. And those are available. Someone has published those as well. And then uh, one other thing about uh, John Boyce. Uh, at his death, he left as many leaves of manuscripts that he had lived days in his long life. I looked up his age. He lived 83 years and 11 days. Well, I got a few more years to go for to be that, that that total goal. 30,306 days. Imagine living over 30,000 pages in writing. Tremendous. Not only not, but put it down in writing. Uh, a writer, and he was so familiar with the Greek Testament that he could at any time turn to any word that it contained. These are translators of our King James Bible, and there's a comment I want you to see of. Uh, McClure, uh, McClure uh, in this book, he says, Few indeed are the living names worthy to be enrolled with those mighty men. It would be impossible to convene out of any one Christian denomination, or out of all of them, a body of translators on whom the whole Christian community would bestow such confidence as is reposed upon the illustrious company, or who would prove themselves deserving of such confidence. And the men that gave us our translators today, I, I don't want to demean them. I'm sure they did the best that they could. But to say that they are superior to the King James translators, I do not buy. I do not buy. We in this culture in which we live, with our schools, everything else that goes around, we are small, insignificant, tiny, different compared to the giants that gave us our King James Bible. A Gulliver's Travels is a book talked about a man that went into a little tiny land, the land of Lilliput, as you may recall. He was a big tall man, one of these little pygmy people, and uh, they said, I know how to capture him. And he's asleep. We take little threads and cords and we'll wrap around him, wrap around him, wrap around him. And they got him so he couldn't move. I liken the King James translators to Gulliver, strong, tall. And the new ones, or these new versions, as Lilliputians, tiny, little, insignificant people compared to the giants that gave us our King James Bible. Uh, that's just my opinion, of it, but, and I think that this man McClure would agree with that as well. Well, <coughs> notice now, this is another thing he said. I like this way McClure phrases it. And what has not been done by this most able and best qualified divines is not likely to be, be done by obscure pedagogues, broken down parsons. See, he's talking in 1857 when he wrote this book. And they tried to get together other versions and so on, competing with the King James Bible. Uh, obscure pedagogues, broken down parsons, secretaries of a single idea and not a wrong one, who from different quarters are talking big and loud. Now, he wrote in 1857, but these are the exact words that are used by those in the modern versions today. NASV, New, New International, uh, English Standard Version. They talk big and loud of the amended, improved, and only correct and reliable retranslations. And getting up American and foreign Bible begins to print their sophomorical performances. That's a good word, sophomorical. Familiar with those Greek words? Sophos and moros. Sophomore. Sophos is wise. Moros is fool. Sophomore. Wise fool. Sophomore. So that's interesting. And so uh, he does not believe that they can do I don't believe they can hold a candle to the 
to the ones that gave us our King James Bible. And then uh, we go to the next chapter, chapter 4 of our King James Bible, uh, our defined King James Bible. It's God's Word kept intact. God's Word kept intact in English because of the superior technique, superior the translation technique. First, the team technique. Now, we said uh, before, I made a change in this latest edition of our defined King James Bible. Uh, the early edition, we have a subtitle. If you'll see, the King, Defending the King James Bible, a fourfold superiority, superior texts, translators, technique, theology. Then I have a caption under here, God's words kept intact in English. I changed that in this tense printing of this book. It used to be God's word kept intact in English. Why did I change it? Because the modern new fellows of the fundamentalist group, as we said earlier today, Say so the word of God is all they believe that has been preserved. And the word of God just think, means the thoughts, ideas, and general ideas. But the words of God they deny are preserved. So I changed this to God's words. I want to be specifically, I think word and words mean the same thing in the scriptures. Whenever we take a bunch, we say that I would have ahead of my heart. It means God's words. But I want to be absolutely clear. Let's go into the superior technique. First, the team technique uh, is superior. Uh, they had these teams. They had three teams, uh, or companies they called them. There's the Westminster team or company, uh, Old Testament, Genesis through Second Kings, New Testament, Romans through Jude. The Oxford, they met in Oxford. Old Testament, Isaiah, Malachi, Gospels, Acts, and Revelation. Cambridge team, Old Testament, First Chronicles, Ecclesiastes, and the Apocrypha, not Scripture, History only. And we talked into the Apocrypha on that last question. I don't agree with it. So these are the teams, this team technique. Now, uh, the new versions sometimes have a few people to do it, but usually they have one or two or three in the Hebrew, one or two or three in the Greek, and the rest of them they just say, okay, it's all right, and they just they say that's what it's all about. But they don't have this team technique that is used. Uh, it's important that we see. It's a, it's a very important type of a thing that was used for that. They had rules to handle these teams. Uh, they had rules that the... King of England laid down. The rule number eight was that every, and I want you to see that every single word of our King James Bible was gone into 14 times. 14 different times. Rule number eight, each particular man of each company, you'll have to take the same chapter or chapter, and there, on the average, seven men in each company. There are six companies, seven men in each company, roughly, on average. Each of those men will take the same chapter or chapters, translate or amend them severally by himself, where he thinketh good, all to meet together to confer when they have done, and agree for their parts what shall stand. So they had to have individual responsibility of translating. They couldn't just have one or two or three. Every one of those fellows had to be strong enough, know the language enough, to be able to do the job. And so that's rule number eight. And rule number nine, as any one of these companies... Uh, has dispatched any one book on this matter, they shall send it to the rest to be considered all seriously and judicially, for his majesty was very careful at this point. There are six companies. Every time they arrived at a translation, wherever it was, they would send it to the other companies, five other companies. So here we have seven men translating. I'm going to get to 14. I'm trying to get to 14, all right? Then they send it to the other companies, five more. Seven and five are what? Twelve, okay. We got that. <laughs> All right. And we go from there. Uh, <clears throat> rule number ten. Uh, if the company reviews so that doubt or differ upon any place, to send them word by where they differ, in which if they do not consent, the diff uh, difference would be compounded of the general meaning, which would be at the chief person of each company at the end of the work. And so at the end, they had all the readings have to, have to stand. Now, that would be the final going through. And how am I going to get 14 out of this thing? 7, and 5 is 12, and 1 is 13. Maybe they'll be able to figure 8 companies. Let me see. I'm trying to figure out. We have 14 last time. Look. <laughs> Must be their average of 8 people per company. And there's 8 plus 5 is 13. Plus one is 14. All right, let's go with the average of eight. Eight times six, 48. That's about right. So eight of them. Uh, so they're very serious. They, they had to put everyone at the end uh, so that each one of those had gone through at least those 
uh, 14 times every book. And then uh, the final thing, one of these other things that they had, rule number 10, the results of Virginia 10, 12, rule number 12, is <clears throat> letters to be sent from every bishop. Now, to the rest of the clergy, and marching them to translate in hand, to move and charge as many as being skillful in the tongues, Hebrew, Greek, and others, and having taken pains, not diligently, diligently to other languages, uh, to send his particular observations to the company, either at Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford. Now, uh, the translators today, I don't think, have, have used this method. See, apparently the bishops or the leaders of the churches in that time had copies of what the translation was. They sent copies to their men that were skilled in the languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. If they had anything to add, send them to these companies, to these three different companies, Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford. Uh, now that was, so, so there may have been many, many more, not simply the 45 or 50 that uh, translated King James Bible, but other people skilled in language to give input. That's what we should always do to try in language, to get every input that we can get to make it the very best. And that's exactly what they did. That's the team technique <coughs> of the King James Bible. Now let's take a look at the superiority of the technique, which is the translation technique. This is vital. To have the technique of translation approved and uh, the superior is most important. So I want us to see this especially. <coughs> now there are different ways that the King James Bible uh, has used to translate. They use the term formal equivalents and verbal equivalents, those two things. They reject dynamic equivalents. Now we'll see what meaning of those, I think, on the next slide, what it means. What does verbal equivalence mean? Well, that means it translates words. Verbal means words. And so it translates words from Hebrew or Greek into English. It was used by the King James Bible, rejected by modern versions. This is how occasionally they get the words right. Don't get me, don't make me wrong to say that they all never have any words correctly. You know, they do. But that's not their main purpose. In fact, in the NIV, it says we're not interested in the word picture, but the overall dynamic equivalence, not the verbal word. They even announce that, see? Now, it's important that we translate words. Remember uh, the first question this morning that was Satan's question, Yea, hath God said? And the question was, didn't he say of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat? Yes, he said that. But the next verse says, But of the tree in the middle of the garden you shall not eat. The day you eat, the shall surely die. Satan didn't completely quote the whole subject. The words are important. Translate words. And as used by King James and not by modern versions at all. The words must be specific. Otherwise, we don't know what's that. That's what verbal equivalence is. And then, uh, <clears throat> what's formal equivalence? Well, that's the forms of the words. Uh, the forms of the words from Hebrew and Greek into English, used by the King James Bible, rejected by modern versions. The forms of the words, there are six or seven, I remember exactly, I taught English for nine or ten years, I don't know, 18 years, 19 years, okay. Uh, there are six or seven parts of speech. I don't remember how many, but six or seven parts of speech. Those forms, if the Old Testament Hebrew, Greek, Testament Greek is a noun, wherever possible, bring it over in English as a noun. That's formal equivalence, the forms of the words. Don't change the noun into a pronoun. Now, in the original, if it's a pronoun, transfer it into a pronoun, wherever possible, in the language, in the English language, or any subject. And uh, same with verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, all these different parts of speech, wherever possible, the forms transfer it over. I realize there are some idioms, of course, that have a little difference, but that's the purpose, formal equivalence, uh, where the King James is, is, is preferred in that and is best. These new versions, someone asked me at the break this last time, what about the New American Standard Version? People are saying that's the most accurate version there is, or the New International, or whatever. I told them, I said, we went from Genesis to Revelation on the New King James, the New American Standard, the New International Version, and uh, looked at those things and listened to the King James Bible by my ear. Now, I followed these other versions. In the New King James, I found over 2,000 instances where they had either added to the Hebrew or Greek words, subtracted from the words, or changed. There were 2,000 places 
for they did not preserve the word forms or the words themselves. I took the New American Standard Version the next year and from Genesis to Revelation and I found that they had over 4,000, not 2,000, over 4,000 examples. I have them written up there in, in print. We got them. Well, they've either added to the words of God, subtracted the words of God, or changed the words of God some other way. I use the same for the New International Version. I got over 6,653 places of adding, subtracting, and changing. I stopped counting. They're all over the place. I didn't want to devote my whole life to it. But there are thousands more in the New International. And the, the purpose is not formal equivalents. It's not verbal equivalents. And uh, these, these things, uh, but the King James Bible, that's their principle. Now, a question was asked, uh, before, in the break, I think also, uh, what about the few times where people charge the King James with making dynamic equivalencies? I said, all right, that's fair game. Let, me, let them write, write, write me to them. Give them all their, their analyzer, see. What's the total? And, of course, I always say, well, here's one thing they always use. God forbid. Old Testament, New Testament, God forbid. God is not in the Hebrew, it's not in the Greek. What is in there? Well, in the Greek, it's ugenota. Ugenota. May it never be. In King James' land, in England, 1611, God forbid means may it never be. So, <laughs> granted, they don't have God in it, but the, the translation is pretty accurate. They know exactly what they If you want to count that 10 or 12 times, fine. Does it come to 2,000? No. Does it come to 4,000? No. Does it come to 6,653 and I stop counting? No. Another thing I like to say, look at the Old Testament. Long live the king. That's not what the Hebrew says. May the king live long. No, the, the Hebrew says long live the king. May the king live long. They translate it, God save the king. Now in the English language over in England, God save the king is what they mean. May the king live long and keep it going. See, Granted, how many times they say that? Three or four times in the Old Testament. So you put three or four, plus ten or twelve, fifteen or so, fine. Dynamic equivalency. So I say that. I think it's excellent translation. Now, the man that asked me a question, he said, they got it one other way. I can't remember what it is. But whatever, very few times. But that's because that's not their principle. The principle is preserve the verbal, the words, and preserve the forms of the words wherever possible. Too long on that one, but uh, let's see what the inferior new versions do. Well, their technique, they reject the verbal equivalents. They reject the formal equivalents. They use dynamic equivalents. Now, not that there's never any time when they don't have verbal equivalents, but that's not the principle. The principle is not verbal. They don't care about the words. They don't care about the forms. They don't care about anything. If Paul has a big, long sentence, as he does many times in the book of Ephesians, one of these doctrinal books, they chop that sentence into two or three parts, see? You don't do that when you're translating. In the Old Testament, it's just Moses went up the hill. That's what the Hebrew says. They don't say he went up. They changed the Moses to he. See, you say, well, that's a little thing. The well, little things, uh, big oaks from little oak, or acorns grow. Little things are important. If you can't trust all the he's and the nouns and pronouns, where can you trust them? Many things, and we point these out in our materials. Uh, sometimes they say he went up, and they say Moses. Now Moses isn't in the Hebrew there, or Paul, or whatever. See, they put the he. They, they just add to the Word of God, subtract the Word of God, change. Uh, they reject this as a principle in the translations of the Word of God. Now, what is dynamic equivalence? See, dynamic equivalence. And we're going to stop, well, one more, and then we'll stop for questions. So, this is an important concept. The inferiority translation technique uses what they call dynamic equivalence. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? My, oh my. They don't understand what it means, but it sounds great. Uh, sometimes, like the woman that went into the church, I always tell this story. She went into this church. The pastor was a pastor that had big words. And she went out of the end of that service and what a wonderful sermon that was. Oh, I didn't understand a word he said. If that's your definition of what a wonderful sermon is, you don't understand the words are so big. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> that's not what you say, good sir, but... Words mean something. And dynamic, now, dynamic usually means moving ahead, flowing, see, and dynamic, see, like a river, dynamic. Well, equivalence usually means exactly the hold your own, do what it says. How can you have something that's moving but staying the same, see? 
I'll give you a question right now. Everyone of you, please respond. I want you to sit in your chair and stand up at the same time. Go. You're all sitting. No, all right, I'll give you another time. I want you to remain silent and speak up. Go. At the same time. All right, see, that's what the dynamic equivalence is. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's a, it's a, but it sounds beautiful. And that's why they love to put this in. Oh, our new international version. So much superior to your King James Bible. It's dynamic equivalence. Oh, it's beautiful. It doesn't mean a thing. But they love it. And uh, we've got to... Now, <clears throat> let me define dynamic equivalence. They don't like to define it, but I'll define it for you. I'm not saying, oh, wait a minute, it's the wrong one. There we go. <clears throat> Three things it does. Number one, it adds to God's words. That's sin. Dynamic equivalence puts in the words of God and adds. It subtracts from God's words. Sometimes it just takes away. That's also sin. God says, don't add, don't subtract. And it changes God's words in some other way. That's what dynamic equivalency does. That's why when I went through the, the New King James, the New American Standard, and New International, 2,000, adding, subtracting, changing, 4,000, adding, subtracting, changing, 6,653, and stop counting, and I read, adding, subtracting, changing. This is dynamic equivalency. They just exactly, and I've got the, the verses and the places to, to show for it in the studies that we made. And uh, I do not count synonyms in the 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. I don't count synonyms. That's fine. They translate something different than the KJ, and it means that you get it from the Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. That's fine. But complete changes, we don't go along with. All right, time for questions. We'll stop right here and pick it up. One lady this morning, she said after class, said, I didn't know how I should ask this question. It seems like such a foolish question. I said, ma'am, go ahead and ask me any questions. Nothing, no questions. Foolish. She just simply said, when was the first King James Bible translated? Well, that's a good question. 1611, and you know, people don't know. Who knows about 1611? If you're not familiar with it, it's fine. So if you have a question, you think it's foolish, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> if you think it's not foolish, I'd like to hear that too. <laughs> well, we're, we're probably we got ten minutes, we just look at each other. <laughs> you look better than I do, but... <laughs> Maybe you can tell us uh, what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to continue. Now, tomorrow at Sunday School Hour, uh, Pastor said it would be all right. I want to have questions and answers. You know, write that whole thing on the Bible, any subject that comes to mind, uh, to see what the, the church people have in mind, what they have in mind. That's in the morning. And then in the afternoon, or, or the morning service, rather, that will be Sunday School. Morning service will begin uh, the theological superiority, usually the King James Bible. We'll continue that. Then on into the evening service as well, to show that the theology of our King James is, well, is, is good. That's a good question, Pastor. Another question. Yes, sir. Talk a little bit about the new versions that have come out, the ESV and the Royal Bible, in terms of philosophy that was behind them. I don't know a whole lot about them. I just know that they've come out in the last few years or so. The Holman Bible, Holman, uh, what's another name? There's another name that goes with it. Broadman, Broadman Holman Bible and the English Standard was ESV. The Bodman Holman put out, I think, by the Southern Baptists. They, many of them use the new the Revised Standard Version, but they want to get one of their own. And the philosophy is the same philosophy as these others. They use the wrong text as far as the Hebrew text, or the uh, Biblical Baker of Stuttgart Tensure, and also the Greek text. They use the Nesalond or the, the uh, United Bible Size text. And the translation technique, uh, the Broadman Holman, I just checked a few of those things in the Gospel of John that came out, and they used the same old adding, subtracting, and changing rather than always keeping on the, the formal and uh, the verbal equivalents. Uh, that's the Broadman Holman Bible. That's catching on. To, I think the reason is they want to have some uh, community, I guess, and the Southern Baptists want to keep united and have one version they can all use. But I think it's, it's uh, I've not gone through it. I don't intend to. I've got other things that are more important, but. The English Standard Version, that's an interesting version. Now that version, as it says very clearly, takes the modernistic apostate National Council Revised Standard Version, 
and dresses it up so the Bible-believing Christians will accept it. And it's so dressed up, in fact, it uses the same false text underneath it, the same dynamic equivalencies, and we had a small analysis of that too, and I showed that in a certain number of chapters, if you multiply that by the whole thing, I didn't see the, take the whole thing, don't intend to, but the same adding, subtracting, and changing as far as translation techniques, and uh, that's dressed up so that the Bob Jones University not only has the New American Standard and pushes that in their bookstore, but also the English Standard Version. And uh, they're dead set against the National Constitution, against the Revised Standard Version. Uh, now they, they have to clean it up a little bit. The Revised Standard Version of the 1950s uh, had a young woman, in, uh, Isaiah 714, instead of a virgin. So they, they made a young woman. They made straight out a lot of those things. Now, before all, the International Council on Religious Education had a copyright on the text of the Revised Standard Version. And they had permission. And someone gave me a letter from the president of Bob Jones University just recently because we have been saying every single copy that's sold is a contribution of the Apostate International Council of Religious Education, which is a liberal organization that the National Council of Churches is, is part of. We were told the letter by the new president, Stephen Jones, I guess is Stephen Jones. No, that's not the case. What they did they paid him over $600,000 to the apostates. They didn't have so much about it. They paid him right up front, $600,000 to the coffers of modernism in order for them to print the English Standard Version. To have the modernists say yes. So that's the background of the ESV. We've got about four different articles in our Bible for Day ministry, which I'd be glad to uh, email you or whatever if you want to. Dr. Don Jasmine's written some excellent articles. I wrote a few things and so on, but it gives you the background, some of the things that are inferior about it. That's a good question. <laughs> Both those were. Other question? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the New King Street version. Uh-huh. I'm just wondering why they used the word King King's version in the United States except for that what they said and the Assembly Act is from the other part of it. The New King's version uh, I don't think that's correct, ma'am. I don't mean to contradict you, but they claim it's the Texas Receptus underneath it, see, rather than the different text. But I found at least three places where the New Testament text was not the Texas Receptus, but was the wrong text. So, and then one of my friends went through it, they found about a hundred places. But they claim, let's say what they claim, they claim it's the Texas Receptus, the same one that underlies our King James. That's what they claim. May not be true, may be true mostly. But the problem that I have with it is this. In the teacher's edition, put out by Nelson Publishers, the teacher's edition, not just the regular New King James, the teacher has notes at the bottom. And every time they want to change something up here, they say down here is N-U. The initials N-U. N stands for Nestle's critical text. U stands for United Bible Society text. And they put that down there. And then also they put MT, it stands for the majority text. The change of the text receptors in over 1,500 places. And so when they don't like a reading up here, Nelson has down here, oh, if you want to change this up here, go with the apostate, new, you know, Nestle Island, United Bible, or else the majority text, and change it down. So those footnotes change the whole thing, which is a real, you know, it seems strange if Nelson thinks the New King James should just stand on its own legs. Why do they have all these things to change it? Just like the, they may not use the text, as you say, up there, but down here they have it, see, in the study edition. Some people come up to me and say, well, listen, my new King James doesn't have these things in the footnotes because they don't have the study edition. They have the regular edition. Maybe some of the Nelson people heard I was talking about the study edition. They, they sort of don't sell as many of those, just have a few footnotes, but not the real things. But the new King James goes by the name of, of King James. It's very deceptive because it, it uses the name and yet they change so many things. It's a very deceptive situation. And uh, in the back of the book, uh, in the study edition, it's page 1450, I don't remember exactly the page, but they say this. They say, we put these footnotes in here, which gives you the critical text of Nelson Island and United Bible Society, or the majority text. We put these footnotes in here so that you, the reader, could be a textual critic on your own. In other words, you can decide. You want to take these in the bottom or you want to take this on top? See? Why doesn't Nelson make up its mind? They print a Bible, they think this is the way to go, go with it. See? So there's a lot of problems with the new 
King James Version. A lot of people, now you might say, well, it's, 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 you know, it's closer to the King James and the New American Standard, the NIV, or any of your standard version. Yes, it is closer. But sometimes it's closer, so much closer that they, people are want to buy that, and so they think, well, it's just a few changes. Well, there's a lot more changes, just a few changes, uh, 60,000 or so, the changes in the words. A lot of them are the same, but uh, it's, a, it's a strange situation. And as I said, they don't like the these and the thous. We'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, as it says in John 3 and verse 7, uh, verily I say unto thee, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And the New King James and the New American Center, all these others say, I say to you, you must be born again. You and you, instead of thee and ye. Well, thee is singular, and ye is plural. We'll get into that a little bit later. But he's talking to Nicodemus, saying to thee, one man, ye, all ye Pharisees, must be born again. So there's lots of different things on that New King James. And uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Huh? All right, the footnotes. What they usually do, they have some, but usually on the side of the margin, they have certain things. Uh, some of them have uh, some alternate uh, other translations. If you want to, maybe the Hebrew literally with this, but this is the translation uh, for it. They do have some of those. A lot of people say that, uh, that these are all corrections of the text. That's false. Uh, there are very few. Corrections, as if the King James translators didn't believe that Hebrew word or Greek word should be there. They're just simply elaborations. In a more technical, literally it's this, but the translation would be this. So those are the notes on the sides. They're helpful, and, uh, but they're not uh, anywhere near what people have said that they were. Other question? Yes, honey? How do we reach you uh, on the computer? How do you be reached on the computer? All right. Bible? For today, F O R today, dot O R G, Bible for today dot org. That's all. We're up there. We have a whole bunch of things on our on our internet. We got a high speed internet. You can even bring it down in, in the, our actual services. Uh, we go 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the internet all over the world, and we have preaching services from Romans to Revelation, verse by verse, that you can hear. There's a brown box. You put click on that, you can hear that thing. Our, our services, uh, we say, at the time we push that to make a live service during the time, but there's a yellow box also where you can get the services we preach in that same Sunday morning. Uh, preach, you can get the copies of that immediately. So we hear from a lot of people. We're glad for that. I was telling the pastor, uh, we heard in the audio portion this past month, month of September, we had a new record of downloads. Now, the ShermanAudio.com doesn't tell us how many listeners are listening, just how many people download that message onto their computers. The downloads, you multiply by two, sometimes by three, to see how many listeners. Usually, the listeners are two or three times more than the downloads. See, but our downloads went months before 10,000 downloads. We went to 21,000 last year, or last month. Don't understand why, but we did. Uh, we had some things up there that people wanted. <laughs> Our former record was 20,000 downloads uh, per month. And we've been doing 10 and 10,000. So I don't understand. We have all 50 states download at least one message each month and 62 foreign countries. Guess which country leads the downloads of all the countries of the world, of these 62? Can anybody guess? You got it, China. 1,500 downloads from China. See, those comments, they don't have any freedom and radio and other things, but they can get on that internet. They can hear the gospel of Christ. Praise God for it. Pray for those people that are downloading. Take ten. Pastor? Oh, one more. Whoops. One more. How do I reach people on the computer? I reach them by email. If you have an email address, would you leave it to us there? We can put you on the email. Keep in touch with us, see? We have, uh, I think, 2,900, something like that, uh, addresses that we send out things, and people will try. Uh, be glad to put you on that. If you give me your email address, whatever it is. And I know uh, Guy is, is on it. We, we hear from him and, uh, and Barbara Crowder as well. Okay, can I go now, honey? Okay, Pastor, take over. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay. And we want to welcome the crowd that's here, by the way. I'm sorry. I think they called me, and they're members of the church. Yeah. And they're in the area here, and I'm closer here, I guess, than the colleagues were. And they said, well, we'll come here. We want to have Dr. Waite put on the conference. I heard Dr. Waite, um, I think it was this year, early in the year, down in Princeton. He had a conference down there, and that was very good. Same as this, pretty much. Um, all right, you have uh, about eight minutes. You want to stretch a little bit, and then we'll come to our final session for today. So uh, go ahead and stretch and move around a little bit, and we'll start again at 3, and we'll be done at 4 o'clock. Amen. Amen.